Hello and welcome to the National Road Safety Partnership Program webinar, Bingo Industries Safe to the Core, How an Evolving Safety Culture Drive Business Success. Uh, my name is Jerome Karslake, I'm Director of the NHP and its many activities. Uh, to find out more, please check out the NHP website, register for our newsletter, or even better follow us on social media such as our LinkedIn page. Um, today's session is going to go for approximately 60 minutes. Um, we actually have quite a few pause points as we go along um, and because we want lots of discussion throughout. Following uh, the, today's session, there will be a recording and a PDF which will be shared uh, with everyone who is here or miss, might have missed it and look up on the NHP website as well. Uh, we really love to make our uh, sessions as interactive as possible and really want to hear from your input. Um, please take the time to throw in the questions here. We have got about four or five question pause points where you can draw in following some of the key case study areas where Jamie and Ben are going to really expand on. You also throw in a lot of chats as we're going and um, we really want to see how you can sort of, uh, what your thoughts are and we can make it as interactive as possible. So uh, let's move on. Our presenters today, we're super lucky to have Jamie. G'day Jamie. Hi mate, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to come and um, chat today. It's exciting. Awesome, and joining Jamie, we have Ben. G'day, Ben. Hey, Jerome. Um, yeah, following her, Jamie, it's an exciting time to have a bit of a chat about all the things we've been doing in Bingo and hopefully share some learnings with the rest of the industry. Awesome, thanks, guys. And before we jump in, I'll just give you a quick little bio of them. And um, between them, they have immense 20 years worth of experience at least. So you have two great experts here. Jamie's, Jamie has been with uh, uh, Bingo for nearly 10 years of base experience, joined in 2011 as a collections vehicle driver. Um, he's had a number of roles across Bingo Industries, including senior management, and now in, as a general manager of transport, as well as fleet allocator and operations manager. Uh, Jamie has been instrumental to the evolution of Bingo, and in particular, the transport strategy that has differentiated the company and provided a platform for growth across New South Wales and more recently, Victoria. Uh, Jamie has been appointed the general manager of commercial and industrial business in July 2019, and has recently expanded its focus towards Bingo's newly established bulk haulage uh, division. So, fantastic. And Ben, to give you an illustration of the diversity we've got, uh, Ben, after studying his environmental science, became fascinated with industrial scale waste and resource management projects. He has over 10 years of heavy vehicle industry experience working across major industrial operations, such as oil refineries, wastewater treatment facilities, landfills, industrial scale composting operations, and recycling. Uh, ben joined Bingo Industries four years ago. He's been heading up the safety, environment, and quality department of Victoria before transitioning into a role overseeing the Victorian operational responsibilities. Um, so throughout Ben's time with Bingo, there's been rapid growth in Melbourne. Um, and we're super excited to hear your journey now, guys. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jerome. Well, I'm going to kick off first and, and take it through a bit of a of a journey for those on the call who aren't fully aware of what Bingo is and what we've done. I'll give us a bit of a, an oversight and I'll walk through our, our key focus, our safety journey from that point as well. So um, in short, who we are, we're, we're one of the biggest B&D recycling companies in Australia um, who's been relatively new. So we've grown very quickly across New South Wales initially with rapid expansion, focusing on innovation and customer service trying to break the old model of, of the unbranded truck, the guy in the singlet with a cigarette in his mouth, not there to do a professional job. Um, Daniel and Tony Tartak saw an opportunity and we jumped into it with branding, new trucks, new fleets, a real strong focus on customer service. Uh, once that started growing, the next leg of the journey really came into the recycling part of the business and what we could do with the material we were collecting and how we could return it to a circular economy. And that was a really exciting step for the business. So on the back of that, they had a, a new vision, um, which was pushing for a waste free Australia and how we can grow with based on customer service, innovation, technology, and pushing for a waste free Australia. And that, that's resulted in really rapid growth across the network, which I'll talk to in a second, but it can be our focus uh, heavily on our, our customer service and how we can do that properly. And as everyone knows in the industry at the moment, across Australia, safety is at the forefront of any business. And it's definitely the safety at the forefront of bingo. Um, and if we're going to go out onto customer sites, working with customers, working with our key stakeholders throughout major cities, busy laneways, you know, we do need to ensure that we can promise all our drivers or our, all the bingo family that they can come home safe at the end of the day. And then we're going to cause no harm or 
interruption to the, the wider public that we're working in around all the customers that we're serving. So we are really focused around B&D, construction, demolition, and then more recently with, with Jamie's leadership, um, really growing the CNI part of the business. So the building and demolition part of the business tends to be the big hook trucks and morel trucks you see um, driving around Australia, picking up demolition and construction waste. And the CNI side of the business is, is more the front lifts, the rear lifts, the crane trucks, the ones that you see coming around to your office buildings and collecting your material and trying to find a really exciting home for it. So there's over 20,000 customers we service annually across the coast and, and growing by the day. Um, and I was lucky enough to join uh, about four years ago now um, when the business expanded into Victoria. So Jamie, if we go to the next slide, maybe I'll talk through our footprint and what bingo is and where we mean at the moment. So this is a snapshot of, of um, Sydney and the Victorian operations. And I'll, I'll talk more about the Victorian operations because that's that's where I'm, that's you know, what I've grown with and, and helped develop here in Victoria. But as a whole, to put into scope of how big the business is that we need to look after, it's well over 1,200 employees now and, and ever rapidly growing. Now we've got 14 recovery facilities uh, as well as spattering of transfer sites and other yards um, for truck parking yards and other and other operations, including bin manufacturing and Toro and other parts of the business. There's well over 440 trucks now, and that splits into a few different departments. So. We've got the B&D fleet of the truck, uh, which is your hooks and your morales, and that's the predominant part of the, um, the fleet in Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, then we've got an ever-growing part of the business being the CNI and the commercial trucks. So front lift, rear lift trucks, they're the ones that come up, flip the bin in, in the busy shopping mall um, and take the waste away for recovery. And we've recently taken on a bulk haulage fleet as well. So I've got 30 of those trucks in Victoria. I think Jamie's got about 40 of the bulk haulage vehicles up in New South Wales as well. So they're your, your large walking floors and your, your truck and dogs, those type of vehicles. So we've got a lot of growth throughout Sydney um, and it works as kind of in, in Victoria and it kind of works like a web. So we want to service customers. For us to service customers well, we need, our, we need depots to drop off waste where the customers are. So we have a network of transfer yards. So we have fast, quick turnaround of our trucks picking up your waste, taking it back, delivering it to our transfer sites, where they can start the journey of processing that material back into a recovered product and trying to divert as much as possible away from landfill. Um, the rest of our fleet, the rest of our network in New South Wales and, and the hub in Victoria being West Melbourne are what we call our processing or recycling yards. And that's where the magic happens. That's where the material comes in and goes from what looks like a, a pile of waste uh, back into largely recoverable material and you know, a facility like Eastern Creek independently audited um, recovers about 85% of all material going into it. We're, we're chasing that in Victoria, we're not quite there, but we're tracking at about 77, 78% of all the material coming into West Melbourne um, is finding a home as a recovered product in that circular economy. So it's exciting, but it's large volumes, it's fast pace. And the way I always talk about it with a, a safety passion and my background, um, we've, we've largely taken all the risks that's in a, in a mine site, and we've compressed them inside a little shed, and then we've had a couple of hundred trucks a day moving through that shed to tip off material and leave. So they're con congested sites, there's a lot of risks on them, and it takes a lot of work for us then to try to manage those risks throughout our business. But today we're here more to talk about our trucking fleet than the recycling yards. I'll try not to go on a spiel too long about the recycling yards of the business. Um, but I want to talk to you about a few specific challenges that Bingo's faced and is continuing to face in the in the transport um, part of the business. So the large one is in short to capture is the rapid growth. This is a journey and, and when you start with a small family business but that's passionate and focused on customer service, um, you, you can grow quickly, but then you need to make sure our systems and our safety compliance not only keep up with the industry, keep people safe, but we're always striving to innovate and, and do the best we could do and keep adding on extra safety controls, extra things that trucks can do um, to make sure our fleet's the safest fleet out there and nobody is caused any harm um, by any of our big trucks yeah, that are on the road. So large growth. I think it started with about four trucks um, and, and uh, roughly sort of 10, 11 years ago, 13 years ago, four trucks to, as I said, now over 440 vehicles on the road. So that's a, that's a huge growth in anybody's eyes. Um, and it comes in lots of different variations of trucks with their own specific risks for us to work through. We're also really focused on grade fleet. You know, we've got a lot of people in this business who might not, might not be truck drivers, but they're driving vehicles. They're driving light vehicles, either for work, to and from work, 
moving between the yards um, and there's a lot of focus on how we can make sure they're safe as well. They're not necessarily professional drivers, but how to ensure that every employee getting behind the wheel knows how what best practice and defensive driving looks like in the business. So thousands of hours of road time each week. You know, truck driving is a hard job. They're the backbone of our business and a lot of the guys during busy, busy periods will drive you know, 11 hours a day, five days a week, plus some Saturday morning work. That's, that's a lot of hours of being a truck um, and to be focused on uh, ever-changing scenarios in front of you. We usually use the term that they're not, they're not truck drivers, they're brand ambassadors, but they're problem solvers and they're the backbone of the business. There's quite a lot in that role that they need to keep focused on and we need to support them and show them how they can do it um, in the safest way. Quite recently, or the last few years, we've also pivoted um, with a lot of focus on, on pedestrians and, and cyclists. We share the road with a lot of people, um, but when you start putting you know, 25, 26 tonne trucks in, in a close proximity to people, that's when you can cause a lot of harm very quickly. That's when things can go wrong and have really tragic results at the end of it. So we've sharpened a lot of our safety focus on that part of the business, um, trying to drive some really good improvements to the vehicles to, to make sure our pedestrians are aware of it. And I won't go into it in detail because Jamie's going to talk about some of the exciting steps that he's really championed in the business. I push forward that we're seeing some really good results out of. Um, driver fatigue, you know, you can't talk about being in a truck without talking about fatigue. It's, it's a big aspect of the business. And there's a few things though that we do differently that I just think underpin why we've been pretty successful in this area and, and what our whole strategy is about um, people first and, and our people and our family first. Uh, and a big part of that is, unlike a lot of companies, we, we don't give our drivers a giant run sheet with 110% of the work that we expect them to be able to do and say, here, here's your 50 jobs, go do those jobs. If you don't get through them all, you're in trouble. That sort of setup um, really leaves you open to, to drivers having to speed, break, breach through their fatigue breaks, be worried that they're not performing because they're not getting through the jobs quick enough. And it can create the wrong behaviours um, in the drivers that we're trying to, trying to foster. Um, so we've moved to a system that, that largely it's like, it's like an internal Uber. We allocate them one job at a time and their drivers are told, this is your next job. Go do that job. Do it well. Do it safely. Let us know when you're finished and we'll give you another job. And we've found that, that to me, that's been a real kind of a, a game changer for our business where the drivers don't feel that pressure to have to push and, and take shortcuts and get through it. They know the focus on the business is for them to go to, to the job, do it once, leave a great customer service and a great image in the business, do it safely, leave, let us know when you're ready and we'll give you another job. Uh, that's really changed the culture from our frontline driver force. Um, also, heaps of challenges around night work, and customer sites, you know, uh, bins don't tend to be put on the front um, nature strip right in the front of the facility, especially in CNI. They're usually tucked away in basements or put away in back alleys. Um, it has a whole lot of challenges when you're trying to steer a big, you know, 20 ton truck down a back alley to flip a bin at the, at the rear. So that's what took us on that journey to, to kind of try to sum up two things. You know, what, what's our zero harm motto? And what are our zero harm rules? You know, what are we going to focus our team on? There's lots of stuff to them to be distracted by. How do we make it simple for them and really hit home? And this bingo zero harm model motto is a pretty powerful one. So in short, it's think safe, be safe, home safe. That summarizes you have to think safe, think about what you're doing, take safe actions at all times so you can get home safe. And, and there's obviously a picture there of, of why it's important for all of us to get home safe. That it's not um, just purely because you know, we want to finish the day without an LTI or a stat. That's not what we're about. So you can get home to your family um, and you get home for what we call the wider bingo family and, and celebrate a lot of what we're trying to do. So when they're thinking safe, we just want to put it in, in all our team's minds up front that the most important thing they do at every job is stop. They need to stop at the start. And this is why we use the term problem solvers. They're not a, they're not a delivery driver. They're a problem solver. They need to stop at the start of the job and have a real think through what's going on. You know, take five. Are there overhead power lines? Yeah, is there people in the area? Are the pedestrians around it? Is it a blind corner? Has somebody put another another bin in a place you couldn't get it or an awning? Yeah, there's a lot of things for people to work through on the site um, and how they get through that point. And then it's just a commitment to be, site, be safe on site. Yeah, they were always authorised, trained and inducted. And, and to give you a bit of a snapshot on what that training and induction looks like, to be a, to be a, a truck driver at Bingo, it's not a 
I've got my ticket, I hop in a truck tomorrow and start driving. There's a really complex pre-hiring process of, of driver trials and um, medicals and everything else to go through. But then it's it's really a minimum of four weeks of one-on-one -on -one training before any driver would be allowed out on the road on their own. And that can go to six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. You know, there's It doesn't matter how long it takes to get them right. Um, it's really a focus on training them properly at the start. And it reflects in a lot of our incident rates that, that not it's not always our our first um, our first six month or first year drivers having the majority of the accidents. A lot of those guys are really well trained and they're, they're focused on what's going forward uh, because of that extended training and onboarding period we have. Uh, we also then put all our drivers through a Cert 3 in, in driver excellence as well and have a, a reoccurring training program. So that's really about trying to promote being safe so we can get home safe. Um, and we do a lot to celebrate that outside of COVID years where it's been hard at the moment, but we, we do put on yeah, pretty infamous um, end of year Christmas parties where we celebrate as a whole bingo family, not just employees, but everyone that goes with it. Um, yeah, I think the last one in New South Wales for 800 employees there, they had about two and a half thousand people turn up. I know we had 600 for 200 employees in Victoria for the last one we had. So it's all the kids, it's the cousins. We embrace that family spirit. So that leads me on to our, our zero harm rules. You know, we've got this great motto, a commitment from the company to get to the right place, but you know, how? How are we going to get it? To that right place um, and, and for us we did a lot of work uh, working looking at our stats talking to our drivers which is always the most important one looking at what had caused accidents in the past what had caused our near misses in the past um, and what what do we believe our, our workers were faced with every day by having lots of conversations by them we wanted to make it really simple so we then broke that down um, with consultation with the work group uh, into um, 12 very simple zero harm rules and the zero harm rules are framed around the most likely tasks that they're going to face that could cause them harm and then it's a clear non-negotiable rule these are followed at all times and, and if I start on the one at the top left it's there for a reason and it's a bit of a, a, a wide open rule you, know, you might say but we start with people first always and we start with it for a real reason um, it's not it, it's to try to frame every one of our employees that they're that our focus and their focus is their health, health and safety, their well-being. You know, that they're more important than equipment. You can replace a truck, you can't replace a person. And, and when we did our deep dive into the data around near misses and reviewed all the accidents we'd had, what we found is often when people were injured or hurt, it wasn't because they were trying to breach a rule or do something wrong. They are actually off, on a lot of occasions trying to do the right thing by the business. Um, you know, they'd, they'd see an issue with a truck, so they'd go and try to fix it or they'd see a, an issue with a bit of machinery, so they'd go and try to unblock it and do the right thing to keep the plant running. You know, that's great, but what we needed to change the mindset was that there's nothing as important as their health and wellbeing. So people first always, it's the main rule, it's the most important rule, it's the one we talk about every day, um, so that all our bingo family knows that nothing is important as them. You can replace a truck, that's why we've got insurance, you can't replace a person's life and part of the bingo family. And then it falls under the, the, the second most important rule, which is take five. You know, that, that's the whole point. It's people put our people first and then reminding our people to stop and think about what they're doing. They are the problem solvers to try to work out how to do this job, which is a hard job safely. But then moving to be fit for work. And, and you'll notice with our symbol and when we talk about it, we very rarely talk about drug and alcohol testing. You know, it's very easy for fit for work to become, you know, uh, is, is a driver impeded by drugs and alcohol? Yes, we've got systems to test for that and make sure they're not, but the real focus is on their mental health and their wellbeing. You know, are they physically and mentally fit to be in that role? It's a long time uh, in a truck and you know you need your wits with you. You need to be focused and split second decisions. You know, we're pretty blunt with our, with our drivers when we talk to them at our toolboxes. If they've been up till two in the morning fighting with their partner or they're going through a hard time at home, don't want them driving a truck. You shouldn't be in a truck if you're worried about you know, your family or, or going through a divorce or, or hard times outside of work. You know, we have to create the culture that they can talk up and know that they come in in the morning and tell their team leader, hey, I barely slept last night. I'm stressed out of my head. The wife's leaving me. You know, something's going on that they know they can raise that and they'll be put in the passenger side seat to do some training or, or do ride alongs or do safety walks and do other tasks in the job with no pushback from the company whatsoever. So that's why that's right up there at the top. Um, it's a real focus on the mental health piece and we, we're very excited we just rolled out a new program called Sonder as well for all our drivers which is a really kind of revolutionary well-being employee assistance program for our drivers that, that for our whole team where it's got a whole lot of functions I won't sell it I'm not here as a salesman but it's been a really good good step for us as well 
And then it runs into some more um, standard ones. Places and equipment must be fit for use. You do your pre-starts, you know, they need the tools to do the job and do it safely. They need to be trained in how to do it. They need to wear the correct PPE and, and be proud of the uniform. You know, we talk about being proud of their jumper, proud of the uniform. We say work to rules and conditions. You know, we all know if it's raining, you don't drive 100 k's an hour. It's a big, dangerous truck. They need to be defensive. Positive communications on sites, exclusion zones, inspecting all loads is, is more to protect our, our workforce in our recycling centres, but they're really important. Always lock out, tag out is, is just about isolating machinery that's not correct to use. And that's just, again, that cultural change from some drivers in the industry who, who felt like they were pressured to drive whatever truck they were given. They know, zero harm rule. People first always, if they don't feel it's safe, if there's, a, if there's an issue with it, they tag it out and maintenance repairs it. It's as simple as that. And then always protecting against falls from heights, which is more to do with the recycling, but it's important for our drivers to know that you know, the simple practices of, of climbing on the bins, which used to be done 10, 20 years ago, is no longer. You can't climb up on the top of a bin because if you fall, you know, there's a big risk to your health. So I hope that helped, guys. That's a bit of a summary from me on, on what bingo is about, what we've grown from. I know it's a bit of a ramble. Um, I'm going to throw over to Jamie now who will take you, you through some case studies or some actually exciting work we've done uh, to try to improve the safety of our fleet. So over to you, Jamie. Awesome, Jamie. Just need you to unmute, mate, if that's all right. Just go to your unmute button. Should be along the bottom, bottom left hand corner. There you go. All right. We're back. Sorry, just bear with me a second, please. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, I think it was helpful to, for, for everyone to hear um, a bit about who we are and, and, and where we are and what we do, and um, a little bit about what our culture is about and, and Bingo's approach to safety. Um, ben mentioned 1,200 employees in the company, over 440 vehicles on the road. So virtually half of our business is, is focused on um, road vehicle and, and the majority of that um, heavy vehicle. Um, uh, road transport and the majority of that heavy vehicle transport. So I, I wanted to use today as an opportunity to um, take everyone through some of the, the transport related elements of a recent case study that we did with the National Road Safety Partnership Program um, and some of the road safety initiatives and systems that um, we run throughout the organisation. So the first one is our um, focus on pedestrian safety um, around our trucks. So this has always been a challenge for us and obviously the transport industry more broadly, but especially with waste collection vehicles operating in you know, the high traffic, heavily populated areas like um, the CBDs of Sydney and Melbourne, Melbourne and the inner city suburbs. Um, but the thing that drove the increased focus was that it, it, what seemed like a, an increase in pedestrian traffic incidents. And there was one particular incident a couple of years back now that hit pretty close to home for our, um, for our fleet. There was actually a pedestrian related incident in the Sydney CBD where a truck was reversing and sadly the man involved lost his life. Um, the incident involved one of our competitors trucks um, it was the same type of truck that we operate in the same area that we typically service in, in the inner city. Um, and some of our drivers on the night actually passed um, the accident scene and, and, and saw what was unfolding. So a few of our drivers came to us um, pretty concerned, as you could appreciate. Um, and it all evolved into, I suppose, what you could call um, a call to arms on, on what we could do. Um, to ensure that nothing like that that happened um, with, with our fleet. So we ran, we ran a month-long program where we had members from our safety team actually out in the trucks with the drivers throughout the night um, doing the runs, um, you know, doing detailed risk assessments on things like laneways in the inner city and those high traffic, um, high pedestrian areas that we typically service. You know, they did things like they took feedback from the drivers on what their day-to-day -day experience are, experiences are. Um, they interviewed pedestrians and members of the public to get some feedback on, on, on what their 
perspective was around heavy vehicles in the city. Um, and the obvious risks that were found were around, you know, high vehicle and pedestrian traffic, one-way access in a lot of the laneways in the inner city um, suburbs and the CBDs, um, traffic around our customer sites. Ben mentioned, you know, a lot of our customers have sites um, with bins in, in awkward locations and hard to get to locations. Um, but the the... The obvious risks um, with pedestrians um, was distraction and, um, you know, the big one is wearing headphones and, and, and pedestrians looking at the phone, um, especially at night time while it's dark. The one, the one most interesting bit of feedback that we got from a member of the public at the time was that um, the beep, beep, beep sound of a truck reversing sometimes becomes background noise and it, it's really easy to tune out to. It's really easy to ignore. So um, we went to the drawing board and, and what we came up with were a bunch of additions to our trucks to try and reduce some of the risks that we identified. So we added an extra reverse camera in the cab of the truck for the driver just in case the um, factory fitted one failed at some point throughout the driver's run. We had an extra um, floodlight type lighting down the sides of the trucks to give the drivers a little bit more visibility that when, we're, when they're reversing into driveways and laneways in, in the middle of the night. Um, and the thing that I was most impressed with was the addition of an audible reverse alarm with a, um, a voiceover caution message. So I actually have a video that I want to play um, that Jerome took when he noticed the bingo truck um, reversing in his neighbourhood. So we, well, what we did, we fitted a few of these trucks out um, with these new additions and, and we ran a trial for a few weeks um, and, and we got some feedback from the drivers using them and then we went back out and got some more feedback from some of the pedestrians and members of public and, and the feedback was massive. There was a considerable improvement in, in visibility for the drivers and, and um, especially awareness from pedestrians. You can see from that video that I played, um, the, the audible reverse alarm um, is very distinct and, and it stands out from the typical beep, beep, beep that you hear um, from a truck reversing. Shortly after the trial, given the feedback that we got, um, we made the decision to retrofit all of Bingo's um, rear lift commercial waste collections vehicles um, in both states. So it's now a standard addition across our entire fleet. Um, we'll just pause in case anyone's got any questions on, on that particular piece, Jerome. Have we had anything come through? Well, we've, had, we've had a couple, I guess. One relates, I guess, to something Ben raised at the beginning. Um, and I just thought, look, Jason was just asking, do you have co-drivers in some of the new, some of the trucks at certain locations? I know from personal experience, do you struggle to get uh, vehicles into some areas, especially uh, to reverse into a driveway from a main road? So... Is that, is that something you guys have to deal with much at all? It was an option that we looked at um, and, and we, I guess we kind of trialled that in a sense as well. Um, we do it obviously when drivers are training, but the, the type of work that we typically do, we're not in the municipal solid waste game. We are servicing commercial waste customers, but not at extreme high density. So our type of work didn't really warrant it. But it's definitely something that helps in this situation. I know a lot of the councils in Sydney and Melbourne do it. Um, it's just, yeah, the, the, the type of customer that we're servicing, it doesn't necessarily warrant it. A question here from Elizabeth. Is it mandatory to have rever reverse audible on trucks? Uh, no, it isn't. Definitely not. Um, we'd like to see it become mandatory. I think it's mandatory in some countries in Europe now. Um, definitely not in Australia, but it's effective. The one downside to it, I might add, is that um, people really now recognise a bingo truck reversing. So 
we've, we've found an increase in pedestrian awareness and um, it eliminates distraction, but people also know that it's a bingo truck. So it, it also poses a bit of a challenge when we're servicing um, late at night, early in the morning, we've got noise restrictions, we've got some disturbance stuff that we have to, um, that we have to work around, but um, finding our way through that's been a challenge, but we're, we're in a good place now. And, and just a question here from uh, road safety, and I guess they're just sort of raising the point, and I guess there's more than just Ronald road users that are distracted with headphones. There's also been concerns of people who might be disabled or impaired for other reasons, such as, I guess you can, you can look at for alcohol. How, has there been much, uh, when you were sort of developing, did you engage or sort of explore those options as well? Yeah, we did. The biggest thing, the biggest thing that we found was headphones, as I mentioned, headphones, mobile phones, but um, it was the Friday and Saturday nights mm. in the inner city of Melbourne, obviously pre-lockdown. Yeah. People are going out to bars and clubs and events. And there's, if anyone knows the Sydney CBD, there's a McDonald's at, at 400 George Street. And to get, to get to the waste bins at this McDonald's, you have to reverse down a laneway that runs off George Street. And if you're doing that at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning when everyone's coming out of nightclubs and bars and pubs it's really high pedestrian traffic um, but what we noticed when we put these additions in the trucks was pedestrians move out of the way because there's a lot of light there's a lot of noise and it's obvious that a truck is coming down a laneway and, and look I'll, I'll support that like i say middle of the day i just happened to be i got back from the milk and next minute i heard the, heard the squawking of the truck coming down the road so maybe go out and have a look so it's certainly quite loud, and I heard that coming all the way through and, and grabbed the opportunity. I guess one other question before we move on. Atul was just asking a question. Is it possible look, with regards to reverse cameras? So do you have reverse cameras in the, in the trucks as well when they're backing up? Yeah, definitely. So I mentioned that at the start. Um, yep. all, all, all of the trucks that we run in our commercial waste business are factory fitted with a reverse camera. But we actually went the next step and we installed a secondary reverse camera that sits on the dash just in case something happens with the first one. Nice. So, so yeah, definitely so one standard, but a lot of our vehicles have two. So you got a redundancy and that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, one last quick question before we move on. Um, so those who are considering it, is there much of a cost, was there much of a cost of fitting the, the audible, the reversing at all? And how long did it take? Is that of interest? The overall cost when you're commissioning a vehicle of this type is, is nothing. You know, you're talking about three to four hundred thousand dollar assets and a, a three or four hundred dollar alarm in the overall scheme of things is um, is nothing really. Um, there was a bit of cost in the rollout and retrofitment retrofitment, so it cost us a good few hundred thousand dollars and it took us about three or four months to get the whole fleet up to date. Obviously, you've got to get the trucks off the road, which is a challenge. Um, but now it's just become a standard fit out in our commissioning process. And really, the cost is immaterial cool. um, okay. in comparison to the results that we get out of it. That's fantastic. And we'll, we'll move, just before we move on, um, do you have mirrors, Phil says, do you have mirrors that show the ground, the left of the truck and right in front of the truck as well? Yeah, yeah, there's the, so there's the regular side mirror up the top and then there's the bubble spotter mirror down the bottom that gives you, I guess, sort of the 260 degree, uh, or the 100, 160 degree um, vision and, and down to the passenger wheel. Then there's, a, there's, a, there's a third mirror that sits up on the, the side of the side mirror that looks down at the actual passenger steer type. I think that that third message, that third mirror is especially in Victoria where we took over some older trucks. That was one that the drivers who had used it before were really keen to get installed on some of the older trucks, or definitely have on the new trucks coming through. Um, that one that goes down is definitely a, a key for the fleet. For our feedback. Cool. Thanks, guys. So the next one I wanted to talk about um, is our in-vehicle monitoring system. A couple of years back we introduced the Lydix drive cam system into our entire fleet. Um, the challenge in this space for us was the difficulty around being able to coach drivers on um, what we call good driving behaviour. Many bad driving habits we found um, were unintentional and a lot of the time, and, and I know I've experienced this myself, um, Jerome mentioned at the start that I'm a truck driver. I, I, I started at Bingo 11 years ago as a truck driver. 
many bad driving habits are often um, subconscious and the driver doesn't even realize it's happening. So the system um, is really impressive for those that don't know. It's, it's an onboard dash cam system that captures both uh, forward facing and driver facing footage via an event capture system on a constant loop. Um, so it's event driven and it works off things like speed, harsh braking, g-force and sudden change in direction. Um, I actually have a few clips that I'm going to play um, to give everyone an idea on the types of scenarios we witness and, and exactly how the system works. So the first one, and I'll explain what, what, what they're showing you because I find that I have to watch these videos three or four times to get a, a good understanding of, of what's going on. So the first one is an image of one of our drivers having a collision incident with a light heavy vehicle that's trying to pass on the inside lane in one of Sydney's main, if you might, you might know it if you're from Sydney, Parramatta Road, but main narrow arterial roads that, that had roadworks. Yeah, it was actually hard to find videos where the drivers weren't swearing, but <laughs> he did a good job to not lose it. Then the next one is um, just some footage of um, a traffic incident with a car who has completely disregarded a give way sign. Another one where the driver did well to not lose it. it, it interesting though, I know, and Jamie. Actually, the guy was backing off as he was coming up. So you yeah. as he was coming in the intersection, you could see, I guess, his spider sense or something was kicking in. He was sort of weary. Yeah, we noticed that. It was a funny one. So he was doing under the speed limit. He was in a suburban street. He backed off coming into the intersection because he could see the car. And it was strange. The car just, it, it appears as though the car stopped, but mm. then proceeded out into the intersection. So um, I luckily. I just think luckily, Jamie as well. But we were probably inches away from that incident being a lot ser more serious than it was. I just think these videos as well, Jamie, show a really good, um, a really good snapshot of the kind of problems our drivers face every day that are not their fault. You know, it's a, it's a, a very um, technically hard job being the driver. They're out there. There's a lot of things happening, and they don't share the road with 100% of other professional drivers. You know, they've got to be defensively driving and aware of what else is going on. These clips are great. Definitely. And then the last one's just an example of um, what we witness, not necessarily um, an event that we were, uh, an incident that we were involved in, but the types of things that our drivers see on the road. And this particular piece of footage, I, th I think, was helpful in, with the authorities with investigating exactly what happened. <laughs> That, yeah, that was a pretty nasty one. Light trucks rolled over onto incoming traffic on one of the main highways in country New South Wales. That was up in the Hunter region in New South Wales. So I guess it gives you an idea of, of, of how the system works and how effective it is. And what we've found over the last few years is that the system's a powerful tool in helping coach good driving behaviour and bringing um, driver awareness to, as I said, those subconscious bad driving habits. Um, we've dramatically reduced driver at fault traffic incidents. We've dramatically reduced the number of inappropriate following distance events, a big focus for us in the, the FY21 year and, 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 and a, um, one of the main KPIs for our transport team was trying to reduce the amount of um, driver following too close events that the system captured. Um, and we had a dramatic reduction in, in those types of events. And it virtually eliminated driver distraction, especially mobile phone use. Um, and, and it's a really handy tool in investigating um, incidents that, that, and, and proving when, it, when one of our drivers is not at fault. And that last point is probably the single biggest factor in actually getting the drivers buying to, to the program. You know, the drivers get some comfort 
in knowing that they have some protection if they're in a situation, if they're in an accident when it's not necessarily their fault, which in a truck is really hard because there seems to be this culture across the community that if there is an, an accident involving a truck, the truck is at fault. Uh, did any more questions come through just on that bit, Jerome? Yeah, it's a really interesting point you make there, Jamie, as well, just on that, because you look at the media, the media is always reporting truck kills, truck this, um, yeah. and, and the data is very clear. It's like 85% of incidences involving a truck are the third party's faults. It's just that a truck is so big that the mass wins, wins out all the time and, and you're only 4% of the nation's fleet. Yeah. Um, so question for you, how have the drivers, I guess, in the early stages as time has gone, how have the drivers sort of reacted to it? Like, has it quite stunned them as what they see? Did, did it align with what they recall in some of these events? Um, I guess there's mixed reactions. Um, we, we, you know, initially, I, I, I mean, now there's full adoption across our whole fleet. And initially there was a little bit of, um, I guess, back foot reaction and defensiveness to things that drivers were doing wrong. Um, but I think over time, it's really helped drivers identify, like I said, those subconscious bad driving habits. The following distance one is, is a big one. You'd be surprised how many car and truck drivers don't understand what appropriate following distances are and what they mean. Um, and, and helping a driver realise that, you, you prove to a driver over time that it improves their driving. You know, they don't have accidents. They don't get fines. They don't have near misses. Um, we address the near misses, you know. So if a driver has um, had to hit the brake suddenly to try and avoid a collision, we bring them in and we have a coaching session with them. And the data shows us that the amount of, of those types of events, the, the, the near collision or collision avoidance events has reduced dramatically. And we actually, we give the driver scores and, and you know, the drivers are, are, are that, they're shown when they progress and when they're making improvements and then they're managed when it goes in the other direction. And I totally agree with this point that Jason raised. Road, road distance behind a truck is not on the car license test. And like I, I even remember the uh, organisation I was speaking with, a senior person, um, she didn't even understand that trucks have a longer braking distance at all. She always thought, the comment she made to me was, um, the space was there and the drivers always were waving at her because she was hot and that's what I was letting her in. <laughs> when I was in there explaining, they need more time. So, um, question here from Scott. What sort of collision reduction numbers have been achieved through these sort of cameras, do you think, through the drive cam? I don't have the data in front of me, but I'd like to say it's somewhere around the 80% mark. Wow. Yeah, in, in Victoria, I can talk about When I say 80%, I'll say um, I'm referring to driver at fault collision. We still have collision events um, we still have traffic related events. I mean, you just saw three that it, it really wasn't hard for me to find three examples where it wasn't our fault. Um, but we've si significantly reduced the amount of driver at fault traffic incidents, traffic related incidents. I think it's really good, Jamie. I know in, in Vic talking the Vic only numbers there, with the, we, with, within six months of introducing the cameras and getting all the buy in from the drivers and pushing through, we saw within six months, a, our month on month incident rates drop by half in the first six months alone. So it was a pretty, pretty drastic reduction down. Um, and then since then, it continued to drop um, based on these coaching sessions, getting it right. And Jamie was dead on the money. A big part was about getting driver buy in. And, and one of the sort of happiest moments I had in the last couple of years at Bingo was when we had a toolbox talk in the morning and one of our, you know, I'd say, grumpiest drivers we had, he actually stood up in the toolbox talk and sort of talked about how much how much his family, you know, how happy his family is about drive cam because he goes home and tells them about how much of a better driver he is and, and the things he's learnt by watching his own behaviours. Um, and that really skewed the rest of the fleet on board as well. They saw... Yeah, one of their kind of key guys talking about how much this has improved their driving and it's coaching sessions. They're not performance management. You're coming in for a chat, watch the video from other skilled drivers and trainers. So it's been a really good, a really good rollout. So actually, I love that line. And you just said it's coaching session. I think using that strengths-based approach to improve the drivers. I think that instead of the big stick. The coaching piece is really important. It's not, it's not beating them with a stick. It's not Big Brother is watching 
it's about continuous improvement. And in some instances, saving their bum when they when they have something go wrong that's not necessarily their fault. So it's, it is powerful. It's an, it's, an one. it's an interesting one. We have to bite your tongue sometimes when we are doing the coaching sessions where you know you have a driver who he's sitting there in a singlet, he's not wearing his top. And you're thinking, okay, but we're not here to discuss the fact that you've taken your bingo uniform off. We're here to discuss your driver behaviour. So it's a lot about how the management team uses it. Yeah, you know, if and and not you know, it's not there to, to pick up things you don't want under company policy. It's there to improve their driving, to make them better drivers, safer drivers on the road. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. Let's, okay, let's, let's keep on going, guys. Yep. The last one um, that I want to talk about, and it's a it's a crucial part of our transport operation, is our um, Bingo Live driver platform that we use for managing drivers' work hours, fatigue, fitness for duty, and day-to-day -day work distribution. So the app is developed in-house by Bingo's tech team. It's something we're, we're pretty proud of. It's taken us a few years, a good few years, probably five years to get to where we are today. Um, and the technology is tailored to our operation. So it allows for real-time management of drivers' work hours and rest breaks. Um, it gives the allocators, the operations team, full visibility of how the driver's tracking in regards to work hours and fatigue. Um, and it even alerts the allocators and the drivers when they're coming up due for, for needing a break. Um, and I mentioned that we use the, the system for the driver's day-to-day -day work distribution. In that sense, it's really helpful for both the driver and the operations team in the office because it links what's happening on site with the driver to the operations team in the office in real time. So we get photos fed through from the driver's phone to the operator's screen. And, you know, when we're delivering skip bins and working in construction sites and servicing commercial waste customers, um, there are a lot of variables. There are hazards. Um, conditions change often, um, especially on building sites, conditions change daily. And this tool, um, it, it's handy in, in, in getting the, the team in the office, the operations team, the allocators, the supervisors, the operations managers, to help the drivers with um, on-the-spot risk assessment and to help them through those challenging situations. Um, so this is really our, um, this is a bingo truck driver's Bible at the moment. People in 2021 say that you can't live without your mobile phone. Our drivers can't live without this bit of technology. It, it is really the, the single biggest tool that they use other than their truck to, um, to complete their work day to day and stay safe. So that was it from me, Jerome. I suppose we've got a little bit more question time. Um, I'm happy to take some more questions if, if anyone so wants. We'll move on so we can hold on over towards the end, but just got some great feedback congratulating you for the app because a lot of people don't realise, I guess, in your sector, like you wouldn't be holding work diaries like Lion Hall and those because everyone's working within quite close space of operations. So it's a bit more... It, it, you haven't got those regulatory requirements in that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the big, the big thing for us with the with, with, with drivers' rest breaks, I suppose um, NHVR regulations um, and and standard and basic fatigue rules. It's almost, in a sense, been developed over the years around um, long haul and, and heavy haulage type driving. And um, my observation across our industry, the waste collection industry, and anyone doing um, local metro driving is drivers don't really like to slash think that they need to take breaks. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to actually get them to do it. But if you make it easy for them, they do it. And, and they realise the importance of it. And when they know that you're going to hold them to account for taking their breaks, that they actually take them. They don't try and work over hours. They make sure they take their breaks at the right time. Our drivers have got a good understanding of uh, the regulations and when they're meant to be taking their breaks. And then we have the ability with the technology to make sure, you know, we, we check what they've, what they've done or what they've said they've done against GPS trackers to make sure that it all lines up. And when the drivers tell us they're, they're stopped for a break, they're actually stopped for a break and not driving down a motorway or something. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's it, just hearing the culture the way. And I, I must admit, like I, I interviewed some of your drivers for our toolbox talks, and it just came through um, the drivers and the pride in actually doing that, taking their breaks, why they're doing, understanding it as well. So I'm not going to attest to that. Now, it's been. A, it's also been a. Um, it's a. You know, I think it's Jamie's Jamie's long that I steal from him a bit, but we're not Google, but the company does really focus on innovation and technology. And, and even at the moment, I know we're building in house a, a new system on our bins in Victoria. Um, a craneable compliance is a big deal. A lot of our bins are craneable and they have to be um, metal stress tested every 12 months. So we're rolling out a QR code system where the driver on the same app just scans a QR code in the bin and it, and it shows up before they take it saying, yes, that bin's within 12 months of certification or no, it's not. And it stops you from being able to take that bin out to the site. It tracks our bins on the network as well. So, you know, we're always trying to strive to do that next thing to make, um, make our driver's jobs easier, but also embrace technology and bring them into the 21st century. There's tools there to use. We just need to adapt them. That's, that's very, there you go. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing that, Ben. And look, now I'll pass on to you, mate, for the, for the next stage. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a very quick um, a quick summary of this and then, and then we can get some questions at the end so I'll leave their time. But I just wanted to talk about, I'll finish with a bit of a, a step we're taking at the moment. Um, it's a bit of a revolutionary change for us at Bingo of, of the way we look at, at risk and hazards and issues in the business. As I said at the start, we've grown super quickly. The business has taken off. There's really strong senior commitment to safety. You know, we work with our drivers. They're the backbone of what we do. They give us the best ideas to help pushing us forward. But we resulted and ended in a place where we've got, like a lot of companies, you've got a lot of documents and swims and, and procedures and policies all sitting there. Um, to try to control the risks, but you don't necessarily have the, the, the confidence that every single one's done every other time. So um, post a, a real tragic incident on one of our sites, we, we brought in some consultants and we said, well, come in, look at our system. You know, let's get the best of the best. And these are the guys who deal with you know, uranium enrichment facilities and the really high risk facilities. So let's get them in and, and go through and, and come and look at our system and say, well, what can we do or how can we change from just having a really strong commitment to, to making sure that our commitments steered down a path that ensures safety in our business. Um, and they kind of identified that that largely a lot of our controls, and you'll hear me talk about controls a lot, that a lot of our controls were, were administrative, training, documents, signs, paperwork, telling people how to do it. And, and there's not a really easy way to, to test those controls if they're working. You know, the classic one of working at heights, you might have an engineered control of wearing a harness, but that's not, it's not necessarily the most important thing to wear a harness. You assume that, but does that harness work? You know, is it, is it damaged? Has it got the, no, no marks to the harness? Is it within a compliant date? So it, they basically turned around and, and changed our process to say, well, as a business, instead of looking at big, long risk registers and trying to, to teach drivers about risk registers and documents, let's narrow it down to what they call their critical controls. You know, what are the, the individual things or items that are gonna stop the unwanted event from occurring. And then you focus on testing the health of those controls. So, you know, testing that the harnesses are in place, check, and that someone's signing off every day that they've inspected for damages. You know, that's your critical control for working at height. So it's revolutionary eyes, um, our approach to the safety. Um, and we've changed what we're trying to do. We've rolled it out on a few sites in New South Wales and we're going through the process with our leadership team in Victoria, actually at the moment. It was just concluded yesterday. So. We've got all our senior leaders in now and they're, they're going through an external training process on trying to take all our risks and pivoting it and just saying, well, let's focus on our critical controls. What are the controls that are keeping our people safe and how do we check them daily, weekly, monthly so we can you know, traffic light it and make sure we're all comfortable through the senior management that our most critical controls are in place and are working. So it's a, it's a big journey of education for the teams as well. It's not just um, you know rolling out. Everyone's familiar with how to read read a JSA or swim. It's how do you get them to that next level where they're understanding what is keeping their team safe and what can they do every day to check on it. And we've noticed that there's been a massive change in language. People now talk about the health of their controls rather than the risk of their jobs, and that that's a big change for us. And it it's worked. It's shown a a, um, a big. Uh, improvement in, in lead indicators, you know, our, our leader-led safety conversations, what we're trying to do, and a big reduction in lag indicators, incidents and accidents. And it's kind of also brought everyone together with a really strong cultural focus on safety. So I, I'm mindful of time, so I won't go on any longer. I'll leave a few minutes for questions, but I just wanted to finish with that. It's, it's a really exciting thing that we're part of, um, and I think it's the, the way of the future to focus on 
you know, a critical controls approach to safety um, rather than giant documents of risk registers that to a driver, you know, what's it meaning for them? It's, it's too too much and not interesting to them. Awesome, thanks for that, Ben. I'm really keen to know what are some of the the the, near, the I guess the uh, the near miss reporting sort of measures that would come in, and how do you treat them uh, quite often? How do you keep the workers pouring them in as well? Yeah, so near miss is an interesting one, and you see different companies treat it a different way. <laughs> to us, we treat. Um, near miss is a real positive. If someone's reporting a near miss, it's a positive thing because it's an opportunity to address it and, and focus on it um, prior to an incident occurring. So that's, that's like with the drive cam. You know, there's near misses there. And times where our drivers are at fault and it's a near miss. But let's celebrate the fact that it was raised up and then work on how we can improve it happening and stopping it again. So, so we report the number of near misses, but we report them as a positive. So yeah. a manager yeah. or a supervisor isn't isn't sitting there going, oh, I've had three near misses, I'm in trouble this month. It's it's more of a, wow, that's good. It shows the culture of his team are willing to put their hand up and say, I, I walked in the wrong place and this nearly happened, or I drove in the wrong place and this nearly happened. So um, it's really, really good uh, focus. And then that leads into, you know, we've got a lot of lead indicators around leader-led safety conversations, truck audits, fatigue management audits, and, and you can see then the, the progress of those cultures and conversations. Yeah. What's talked about is that what, what's talked about is action. So a lot of it's just about having the right conversations and tracking that those right conversations are happening. That's that's fantastic to hear, Ben, because that's exactly what the research sort of indicates. As as the near misses begin going up, you actually begin seeing, I guess, those the more uh, the lag indicators and the big the ones you don't want begin sort of dropping down naturally. And, and it, it seems seems counterintuitive, but that's exactly. And you've just confirmed what we sh what we should see uh, when when things are working well. Um, got a bit of a different question here that came through. I'll just uh, bring it up. One came from, uh, where are we? Because um, there's a lot of fantastic feedback to you guys around um, your app that's come through. That people have been singing out the praises from that. Uh, one was just asking here around the environment, what sort of controls you have with regards to, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find that one now. Um, it was just in the chat, unfortunately. Uh, here we go. Do you have any environmental policies and procedures if a spill occurs, such as wet cement on the road or those sort of areas? Uh, and you're both on uh, mute, by the way. I, I can take this one. We, we definitely do. We definitely do. So we treat environmental. You know, we're we're, a, we're an environmental company. We're here for zero waste to zero waste to land. That's what we're pushing for. So. Um, it's important that when we're driving big orange branded bingo trucks and we're telling the whole industry and telling everyone that we're the best company in Australia for environmental focus, that we're not causing environmental harm when we're driving around the street. So all the drivers have embraced that journey. You know, each truck has spill kits and, and extra equipment with brooms and hoses to, to do it. And, but really it's about getting the behavior right. So it's all about um, if an incident occurs, have a spill, whether it be you know, a liquid spill or a concrete spill, or, some debris coming off the truck um, that they, they know they stop it, they report it through the app the same as everything else. It's tracked as an instant and, and go through the same metrics and focuses. We've also got a, a lot of work that's been done on on tarping and containing loads for our, for our business. So, you know, they, if we're putting a bin on the back of a truck, we need to make sure that we're comfortable that, that nothing's coming out of those bins. So they're designed to be stacked and done the way they're proper done. And we're lucky enough that we sort of own Toro, the company that builds the bins for us, so we can get a bit of engineered um, engineered solutions for our problems as well. Awesome, guys. Well, I think uh, I'm going to ask you both, um, and just, Jamie, you're just on mute still. Um, I'm going to ask each of you just, if you have one message, one take home, take home uh, share you'd like to make to the audience. So I'll start with you, Jamie. Um, for me, it's, I guess it's, um, if you're, so I think, I think there are a lot of people on the webinar today that um, aren't necessarily from a, um, a, a truck driving heavy vehicle transport background. And, and um, I guess it's the, the, the message is um, a bit more awareness around heavy vehicles, um, what's involved in, in heavy vehicles and, and an understanding of um, what the broader industry is, is doing to try and prevent incidents and accidents and make it um, safer for people. Um, but then, you know, I spoke a lot about pedestrian awareness. We saw some footage of um, the types of incidents that occur with heavy vehicles. Um, and I think what we're doing is it's a testament to the broader transport industry because the transport industry, the heavy vehicle transport industry today is in a much different place to 
to where it was um, 10 or even five years ago. You know, the, the things that we've got in place are um, an example of what a lot of our peers in the industry are doing. And I know, I know a lot of companies that do um, more than us. Their, their technology is a bit more advanced. Um, so it's a positive. It's a positive that there's this um, culture of, of, of improving things and, and, and making things safer and, and where uh, our industry is moving towards relying on technology. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Jamie. And it's that shared responsibility. It's great. And Ben, what would you like to leave everyone with? Well, I guess without saying, if you need a bingo bin, make sure you, you give us a call yeah. and we'll get you a bin service. Um, but without putting the sales plug aside for a second, <laughs> it's just really, if, you, if you've never been inside a, um, a heavy vehicle or a truck or a waste truck in the, in the industry driving around, it's an eye-opening experience. And just if you're on the road and you're not in a truck, make sure you you give the trucks, I guess, the respect they deserve. It's a hard job. Um, the guys work very hard to be professional drivers, you know, to be the best of the best and they're promoted for it. So just make sure, you know, be aware of them, be aware of their stopping zones. It's amazing how many times, you know, grey fleet or, or cars cut off trucks expecting to be able to stop and put our drivers in a really risky, a really risky place. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, the webinar and the feedback coming in from the chat is great. There will be a, a survey that will be going out, so please take the time um, to, take, to, to share and, and uh, provide us feedback for the future. So um, thank you, ben, ben. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you to our audience today. And uh, thank you, Bingo, as well. Have a great day. Cheers.